Oh, are you running out of air? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Looks like you're working pretty hard. Oh, hi. I'm Zane Lamprey. In this episode, I go three sheets to Scotland. I should drink with confidence. Yes. I drink scotch. Quite a bit of alcohol. Significant it's... amount of alcohol. I'm pleased you picked that up. And I drink bagpipes. Every night, in every city around the world, it happens. People pour into local watering holes to, well, drink. It's my mission, that's me, to traverse the globe, getting to know these different people and their drinking customs. Bellying up to the bar, and with any luck, making some new friends. Warning, when in Scotland, be aware of anyone who offers to show you their bits and pieces. You'll see more of that later, but first, Scotland, where drinking scotch whiskey is practically a national pastime. As I traverse the highlands and lowlands of this drinker's paradise, I'll stop at nothing to experience scotch in all its glory. It's like $10,000. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. From a scotch lover's mecca <laughs> to a scotch drinking maniac. Get rid of your pants. Come on. I'll even tell you how you can come here and have a drink on me. If it runs out, yep. you can call me up and, uh, and uh, I'll will. go ahead. And, get it. and while I'm psyched about the drinking, the food has me a little scared. But in the States, it doesn't necessarily have a good reputation. I think it's time to man up, put on a skirt, and go three sheets to Scotland. I'm dressed a little inappropriately for Scotland. The play is hoodie, that's, that's fine. But uh, the jeans? Are you crazy? This is Geoffrey Kilts, located on Edinburgh's Royal Mile. They're a small, family-run operation, but their notoriety is worldwide. They fitted celebrities like Vin Diesel, Mel Gibson, Zane Lamprey. Yeah, they're big time. Oh, hi. How'd you guys get here? Hi. Howie. How are you doing, Zane? How are you doing, man? This is Howie, son of Jeffrey, and he's gonna hook me up. Are you wearing underwear? I can't tell you that. See, it's Scottish law. We don't talk about it until we've had a few drinks, and then... Uh, yeah. Then you'll tell me? You don't need to show me. You can just tell me. First, Howie shows me some of the tartans, which are patterns that traditionally represent different clans. That's the modern clan McDonald. That's okay. your main one, or the ancient clan McDonald. Now, what this means is different dyes are from different eras. Okay. So that's like your ancient dyes going from vegetable dyes, and that's your industrial revolution chemical dyes. So that is the same tartan. Howie isn't saying what he wants me to wear just yet. Remember to lie about the measurement. Oh, yes, yes. OK, that's, that's, yeah, 32. Yeah, yeah. These are your big, chunky socks we're going to make you wear. All we're right. going to put you sort of drinking casual night out. First, I try on a Stuart Clan tartan just for kicks. Huh? But Howie okay. says this kilt is still missing some accessories. The kilt pin is just for show. It's like a weight. It doesn't go right through the kilt. kilt like and, that. and what symbol is that? Well, this is my own brand called 21st Century Kilts. Howie says the next important thing is a sporin, kind of like a Scottish man purse. There we go. Excellent. So there you have it. The casual kilt, or as Howie would call it. It's what we call unbifurcated. There's no. Un who? Unbifurcated. Are you sure that's a real that, word? Yeah. I'm it, look it up it's what any sort of skirt, kilt, um, sarong, anything without a crotch is called unbifurcated. According to Howie, the Scottish aren't the first to wear unbifurcated garments. I see the first kilt as being Egyptian. You know, going back 7,000 years ago, men were wearing pleated gabbard sure, skirts. Like the pictures the pharaohs were Yeah, okay. absolutely. And the word kilt is Danish. It means to tuck or pleat. So to me, it comes from the Vikings, mm -hmm. because there was no such thing as a bifurcated garment at the time. There's no such thing as trousers. Bifurcated. So all ancient cultures and men wore different types of skirts. OK, so I kind of look Scottish, but there's one problem. This is a Stuart tartan, and I'm a lamprey. And that's not a Scottish name. So Howie recommends something more contemporary and generic. 
This is the L.A. black. Yeah, basically, really. It's about celebrating the kilt as a piece of clothing and not just heritage. I got the sporin, I got the kilt, yep. the kilt pin, and the chunky socks. Would you say that I'm, I'm all the way alive? All the way alive, rocking. I'm, it's all the essentials. I'm rock steady. You are, totally. So now I'm going to go drink. I should, I should drink with confidence. Yes. Yeah. Scotland, here I come. Fully clothed, I'm ready for my first excursion into the world of scotch. So my crew and I hop into our van and start our journey north to Speyside. Speyside is one of a handful of distinct scotch-making regions. And here, there are several different scotch makers, including the world famous Glenfiddich. Please, don't order Glenfiddich. Order Glenfiddich, <laughs> but don't go into a bar and say, can I get some Glenfiddich? That's something that Curtis the camera guy would do. You need to go in and say, I like me some Glenfiddich. This is Brian, the Glenfiddich guy and he's lined up three different samples. First, the clear stuff. If we were to put this in an oak cask okay. and mature it here for three years, then we could call it a single malt scotch whiskey. Okay. But because this is hours old, as it comes off the still, at the moment this is immature spirit, new spirit. I can drink it? If you wish. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, so that's 126 proof, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> I guess you can just taste the the malted barley mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, quite a bit of alcohol. Significant it's... amount of alcohol. I'm pleased you picked that up. This is something that you would expect to see when you're talking about a glass of whiskey. It's got a beautiful golden color. Glenfiddich, 15 year old. Okay, before diving into real scotch for the first time on this show, let's do some comparing. <laughs> scotch whiskey versus American bourbon whiskey. Bourbon? is whiskey, but whiskey is not always bourbon. John, true or false? No, true. If you saw the Kentucky show, you know that bourbon can only be aged in unused American white oak barrels. Well, in Scotland, they can be a bit more creative when it comes to aging. We use former bourbon barrels. Okay. We use traditional casks, casks that have held whiskey before. Okay. And we use sherry butts. So all of those flavors combine to give a 15-year-old whiskey a multi-layered effect, much more complexity than you would expect in a whiskey of this age. When it comes to shopping for scotch, it can be a little more confusing than shopping for bourbon because of the different subcategories. First, there's the single malt. Single means it comes from any number of stills from one named distillery. Malt means the only grain used to make it is malted barley. Next, blended malt or vatted malt means it comes from a combination of malted barley whiskeys coming from two or more distilleries. Finally, you might also see blended scotch whiskey, which may contain multiple grains and maybe a blend of whiskeys coming from different distilleries. Okay, back to the Glenfiddich 15 year old single malt. Oh, that is nice. Yes, it's nice but I want something straight from the heavens. And Brian has the holy water I'm looking for. The Glenfiddich 50 year old. What would a bottle of that go for? Um, if you were to follow me down to the gift shop now, I could sell you a bottle for 5,000 pounds. 5,000 pounds, it's like $10,000. Effectively. <laughs> holy <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> That's just awesome. Sometimes it's good to be Zane Lamprey. <laughs> Wow. That is just, wow. Here's the problem with introducing something like this, like this to me. I like this now. What the hell am I gonna do about that, Brian? Wow, that's a good $10,000 scotch. Glenfiddich, mm, rich, okay. Coming up, the world of scotch is my oyster. Scotch everywhere. <laughs> Right now, I'm headed to the famed Quaish Bar at the Craigellachie Hotel in Speyside, Scotland. <coughs> Though it's small in size, it has a world-renowned selection of different Scotch whiskeys. Scotch everywhere. <laughs> I've met up with Gordon, 
who's sort of a Scottish Renaissance man, actor, history buff, and as luck would have it, a scotch lover. So the name of this bar is the Quaish. This is a Quaish over here. It's a fairly large one. What's a Quaish? This? The, the silver bowl. This? Put your whiskey in it and you pass it around. That's what the two handles are for. It's just like a, a wee communal cup that you can shiny. pass around. Very, very shiny. We have around us some of the best selections of whiskey in Scotland. You want me to climb up there? You, go you can climb up there. Where am I going? Don't As we scan the room for a few choice samples, we catch the attention of some Scotch Craze visitors from Australia. I've got the capacity to become a Steve McKinnon. An Australian one, though, so a bit more charismatic. <laughs> oh, 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 would you oh, like some? Is that a dram? That's a German dram. That is a dram. <laughs> a dram, by the way, is Scottish lingo for a pour of scotch. Cheers. Cheers. The Scottish guy in the other corner says these Australians have it right when it comes to measuring a dram Scottish style. I mean, when you come around to a house, you ask for one, two, three, or four fingers. But yeah. in Scotland, you ask for one finger. Yeah. That way. Yeah, OK. In honor of that, yeah, we're, we're bring on the dram. Oh, that's a dram. That's a man's dram. Thank you. Nice dram. Gentleman's dram. Thank you. All right, so are there more scotches here than anywhere else in the world? 659. 659. Oh, I only drank, I only okay. drank the 600 last night. Right. But there's another 121 tonight. OK, 29. Uh -huh. So I'd like to try each one. OK, that's fine. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so far, we've explored the way scotch is aged in different barrels and the various categories from single malts to blends. But Gordon says that there's another key factor that distinguishes one scotch from another, geography. The north, north of Scotland up here. West. West, east, east, and that country they call England down south. Ireland. OK. With our table as a makeshift map, we start with the familiar, Glenfiddich, which will act as sort of a benchmark for comparing the other regions. Slangevar. Oh, Slangevar. Slangevar. Uh, uh, cheers, good. Cheers, good. Good health. Health, good. Good health. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Gordon says that Glenfiddich, like all the distilleries of Speyside, uses fresh mountain runoff water, giving it a velvety smoothness. For our next dram, we try something from the lowlands to the south, which uses a different type of water source. And this is just really rainwater in burns, as in rivers. No. Wow. That's got some kick to it. You're right, it does have a kick, doesn't it? It does. It's, it's, it ta <laughs> tastes more. I don't want to still taste it after. I get it tastes boozy. I'm not really? boozy, but it's got a. You can taste the alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's not as mellow as this one. Next, we try scotch from the west. Over to Isla. Okay. It's very peaty over there. And peat is when um, all of the trees and the foliage is broken down and gone to compost and just lies on the top of the ground. So this one is uh, peaty. So this is very peaty. Meaning, the, meaning very, the water comes through the peat. The water falls as rain and soaks itself through the peat. That is interesting. It's definitely got more, more of the peaty, more of the, the, the smoky, the smoky yeah. taste to it. It's waterier. Does that make any sense? Do you know what I'm talking about? Funnily enough, it's almost like it's missing something. Yes. So, we agree. Good. Next, we try scotch made in the northwest, where mountain spring water is used. This is from the island of Skye. This is the island of Skye, where they get their water from? From the mountains. Oh. It's, it's mountain spring water, basically. Man, that's got a kick to it. Mm -hmm. It's very um, sharp. Finally, Gordon wants me to try scotch from the far north, where the water comes from deep artesian wells. We go up to Orkney, so the water is very, very they pure. They have wells that go 3,000 feet? Yes, yeah, it's just an art, like an artesian bore. It's pretty good. It's, it's, it's pretty smoky. Yeah, I kicked that one up. These ones are very, these ones are very similar, I, I find, as are these two. You know, again, these are all, all my opinions. It's, it's mm -hmm. basically what you like. If, I might think this is too sharp, but sharpness may be what you're looking for. Me? No, I like mellow. I'm cool. <laughs> are, those, are those the bad bottles? Why are those in jail? This is a whiskey club. And they, and and they lock their bottles in here? They lock their bottles in there so they can either come here and they can have one of these special reserved bottles, or even if their friends came here. So if you have friends coming here from Three Sheets, they can come here and say, hey, I'm a friend of Zane, so I want to nip out of his bottle. How much does it cost to be in this club? About $1,000, 500 pounds. 500 pounds to be in this club. In this club, plus the cost of the bottle. OK, 
it's time to dig into the massive Three Sheets production budget and give you, the viewer, a chance to have a drink on me. I like to put a, the Glenn Fitter 18 in here. You're number five. I'm number five? Yep. You heard it here first, drams for fans at the Quaish Bar. This offer is only valid at participating Quaish Bars for as long as Three Sheets can afford to keep a full bottle behind the cage. And then the people, they're gonna come here and say, I'm a friend of Zane's. And and then they get to they get to take a dram from, from my, my sure, bottle. No problem. We'll see you here. And I'll be here waiting for you. So will I. And Gordon. <laughs> Coming up, I go in search of something I've been warned about. In the States, it doesn't necessarily have a good reputation. Right now, I'm in Scotland and it's a slow drive through an unexpected snowstorm as we make our way from Speyside to Edinburgh. And though we roll into town late, there's still something I've yet to try. Something that I owe to you, the viewer, to experience in all its glory. Or should I say, lack thereof, haggis. But I'm not gonna eat that stuff without a little liquid courage. So I go to a restaurant bar called Whiskey with an I. Scotch whiskey is spelled with a Y. Irish whiskey is spelled with an E, E-Y. Yeah. And then whiskey here is spelled with an I. Yeah. Yeah. Just the pub, yeah. Yeah. Just to f them up. Yeah. First, a few shots, including something you can't get back in the States. A 21-year-old Glenfiddich that was aged in a Glenfiddich barrel and then yeah. finished in a Cuban rum cask, yeah. right? Yeah. You can't it, get some yeah. mistakes. It's illegal, because if every time you buy one of those, you're contributing money to Cuba. The rum finish is very slight, but something a little more obvious is the fact that the bottle, like all Glenfiddich bottles, is triangular. The bartender shares a popular legend about why that is. There's this rumor that goes around the Glenfiddich distillery. They're triangular because the first owner of Glenfiddich was a raging alcoholic. Wherever he went, he would carry a bottle of Glenfiddich with him. Okay. He would even go to bed with one. Every morning he would wake up and it would have rolled away. He went to his big heart bottler and said, make me a bottle that does not roll away. So in the morning, the bottle of whiskey is still beside me and it went up. Well, I don't know if that's true, but what I do know is that I can no longer postpone the inevitable. Hi, can I get a haggis upstairs at the bar? Zane. Lamprey. This is Chris, and he's the head chef here. All right, so this is haggis. I don't know if it's just me, but in the States, people talk about haggis, and like, you're gonna go to Scotland, you're gonna have haggis? Oh, God. I think it's the inside of a stomach and thrown into a big, giant sausage, and it's disgusting. Chris tells me that there is some truth to that. You could have split peas, you could have barley, you would have oats for sure, you would have primary heart, okay, you would have lung, you may have liver bits, um, all these sort of things ground, boiled down, boiled down, boiled down. So now the question, why has this hodgepodge of scraps become so popular in Scotland? Professor, why do people eat this stuff? Oh, you got it, Zane. Many people believe that haggis took hold in Scotland because in days of yore, when clan sheep would slaughter sheep or cattle, they'd keep the meat and give the scraps to the peasants, giving birth to the common man's dish of haggis. The truth is, off cuts of meat have been used throughout the world for centuries. Haggis just happens to be one of those countless varieties. So don't wuss out and have a bite of your Scottish hot dog, say. <laughs> All right, all right. Time to eat. Ugh. That's, just, that's good, man. <laughs> Unlike more traditional haggis, this is not stuffed into a giant intestinal casing. It's served unpacked over a mash of so-called neeps and tatties, or mashed turnips and potatoes. Tonight, it was my mission to eat haggis, but I was, I was afraid of it. Yep. I was, because I, I thought it was like this, this three-legged guy in the forest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With hair and a beak and God knows what. But this is, no, it's this is actually really good. After thoroughly enjoying what I thought would be punishment, a customer offers to buy me around. Oh, we have a tab. 
No, 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 let a Scotsman pay for this, because no, I don't want this going across the whole world that a Scotsman does not pay. Up until now, you've seen me drink many different scotches in one way. <laughs> Neat. No rocks, no mixers, but Ian here has a different approach. You just splash some water, now that opens up the whiskey. Wait, it's gotta be warm water. That's warmish, it's, it's not cold. It's warmish. Yeah, it's not frozen. Room temperature. Exactly. It's right. Luke. It's Luke. The theory here is that lukewarm water holds back the shock of the booze, allowing you to more effectively experience the flavors of the barley and the barrels. Draw it through, draw it through. Uh -huh. Draw it through. I'm burning through. No, you're not, you're drinking it. Draw it through. Easy. Show me. Okay. Let it, let it go over the tongue. Let, what do you taste? What do you taste? That's what you're saying that you have me do it like that because I'm, I'm tasting it more in the back of my mouth. Exactly. As we down more scotches, and this party amps up a bit, I realize the only other people wearing kilts are the ones that work here. I think it's time to change that. I have a little magic trick. I take this little napkin, and then you, and then you're dressed like a buffoon. Watch this. Watch this. Look at that. Now who looks like a fool? I love that shot. Let's just say that after hanging out with these guys the rest of the night, tomorrow could be a rough one. Wow, see? Are you going to pants on under that? My love of Lewis. <laughs> <laughs>Too rich, too sweet. No. Nice. Yeah. Sal says grease is the word when it comes to hangovers. So he takes some frozen burger patties, breads them, and fries them up. How do you normally eat it? In a bun or no? Fine. Mayonnaise, please. Ah. Then we throw together a couple of whole pizzas <laughs> and toss them into the fryer. It floats in there. And even though this is quite possibly the most unhealthy meal I've ever had on the show or my life, after a two-day scotch drinking binge, from the upscale I love you. to the educational Scotland, you asked for one thing. And the downright obnoxious. Can you edit out his pants? This spread of calories totally hits the spot. <laughs> Scotland, or real men, Highlander. don't wear pants. Guess what the coldest part of me is right now? I would like to take this, this barrel back to, to, the, to the States and trade it for a house in Los Angeles. Is that okay with you? If you can lift it, you can keep it. 